Welcome to the uh, first of the breakfast seminars in the Cardiff SBNS meeting. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking the sponsors, Medprin and Severn, for this session. The topic is uh, cranial closure, and we have two talks, one from my co-chair, Mr. Ravindra Nanapaneni, and the other from Dr. Drinwen Guan from China, who's going to be joining us remotely, and he's already on the line. We think each talk will be around 15 to 20 minutes, so it will give us some time for discussion. Um, cranial closure is a very important aspect of modern neurosurgery uh, in terms of methods and materials for dural closure and repair of skull bone defects. There is such a wide array of choices for both of these uh, aspects. And I'm sure the talks will enlighten us on some newer options available. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce our first speaker for the morning, Mr. Ravindra Nanapaneni, who, who is the uh, senior neurosurgeon at Cardiff. His subspecialty interests include complex spine, oncology, and skull base. I have known Ravi throughout his neurosurgical career uh, and know him as a wonderful speaker and a great intellectual. And it is legendary that one of his early career interviews was devoted to his Mensa score being nearly 200. Ravi, please. This is the first of two talks, and this is about being talking about a novel biomimetic, a scaffold for dural repair. I neither designed the product nor have any shares in the company. I was recently reading about what was the first sign of civilization, and the idea was a healed femur. In an animal, if the bone broke, the idea was that the animal would not survive. So what is successful neurosurgery? The patient surviving. So here we have a Neolithic skull with signs of repair. We have the Edwin Smith Papyrus, a five meter long scroll, which was a surgical treatise of military uh, of trauma. And there are about 48 case reports and looking at different aspects of trauma. And it deals with what happens when you have a head injury. And very clearly it's stated that once the meninges are breached, it is a hopeless case. Nothing happens. There's no much, not much point. And nothing really much changed in terms of our dealing with head injuries till the late part of the 19th century, when three things happened which made surgery as we understand it, neurosurgery as we understand it, to become possible. One was anesthesia, the ability to knock a person out and you didn't have to hold them down. The idea of antisepsis and the whole point of brain localization. With these three aspects, we could just begin to see the idea of neurosurgery developing. And things have moved on hundred years later. We very happily breached through the dura but we do know that CSF leak is a problem and it's best avoided. Depending on the, what the operation is, the incidence can vary. And in its simplest form, it will be a pseudo seal, which hopefully we can get away with, and very occasionally an overt leak, which then needs to be surgically repaired again. So why does a CSF leak happen? It's either because we didn't close it properly, as in we paid insufficient attention, or there was a gap or very occasionally if there was increased pressure inside, driving the force. So what we needed to do was something that would prevent this as a problem. 
So we have dual substitutes. We have tried various ones. Autografts of different sorts. Allografts we'll talk about. Xenografts, which is a mainstay nowadays. And more recently, synthetic materials. We can do it in different ways. You can onlay them, you can suture them, you can underlay them. And most often, we tend to use some sort of a dual sealant. Looking at the different variety of materials that we've been using in the last 30, 40, 50 years, <clears throat> pericranium, it's available locally, that's the best. Facial lata, if you need one, anterior rectus, increases the morbidity when you start taking autologous uh, materials. There are allografts, cadaveric dura was the mainstay before. Now, from bovine to fetal skin and uh, porcine, that's, uh, you know, this horse material that's been used, different forms of collagen, really. And more recently, I would say probably in the last 10, maybe 15 years, synthetic materials. So why is it that we, and we are going to be talking about the bottom one, redura, which is polylevolactic acid. So what is it, what is the holy grail? What is it that we want as surgeons for our dural substitutes? It has to maintain its integrity. It shouldn't disintegrate really fast because the whole purpose is lost. It's got to be easy to handle. It shouldn't stick to the brain because we may need to go back into the brain. It has to have a favorable biological behavior. So the graft host interaction should be, should be such that there is not much inflammation. It should be non-toxic. It should be available in different sizes, and there's no point having a very large size for a very small hole, or very occasionally, because of the limitations of what we have been using, you may need to use multiple patches and try to join them all together and cobble up a jigsaw. Preferably suturable, it should be strong enough for that. If it's transparent, we can see underneath if a clot is developing or a problem. And well, as with everything else, if it's inexpensive. Do we ever consider what does the patient want? Well, it's got to be effective. The patient doesn't want another operation. Well, if the patient is paying for it, it has to be inexpensive. Do we really ask what is the patient's religious or ethical beliefs? There is a paper that we are presenting later on today where many a time the surgeon doesn't know what they're putting in. And we never tell our patients what we're putting in. And uh, previously our excuse was that there was no alternative. That is what it is, so why bother? But there are synthetic substitutes available, and if they meet our requirement, why don't we use them? There is so much that we talk about in terms of Jehovah's Witnesses. There is a separate form, there is a separate booklet that we give. We think so much about what that is, but we don't talk about the majority of our patients, and I believe there should be something there. So why is that? So, ethical permissibility, if we are using an animal product, we need to know where that animal comes from, what animal it is, and does a patient need to be told about it. And if you ask an increasing number of individuals, would they want this done? And the answer is no. And that comes across quite clearly in multiple papers. But this is something that we don't necessarily think about. So this was a paper published a year ago, two years ago. Over 40% of patients said that we are quite happy not to use anything, even if it were, we were to come to harm than to use an animal product. So that data is out there, but it doesn't seem to have hit our consciousness yet. It is something that we still have not acknowledged. Montgomery said, the Montgomery ruling, we must disclose all information that the patient may attach significance to, not what the surgeon may attach significance to. And a failure to disclose that information is not in anybody's best interest. So that's where this product comes in, because I think it meets our requirement. It is synthetic, it's absorbable, and it works as a scaffold. The microstructure is very similar, and we'll look at that. And it helps recruit local tissue. So what is it? It's a chemical, polylactic acid. So it's biocompatible. It's been used for 10 to 15 years with the dura, brain, spinal cord, and nerves. It's biomimetic. It has a nanofiber microstructure. So the polymer is available as a solid. 
when you put high voltage to it, it becomes into an, a fiber-like structure that will form into a sheet. So that's the microstructure of Dura versus Redura. They look very similar. It's a beautiful piece of, uh, uh, it's a beautiful sheet. It's very, very compatible. It doesn't feel like a thick plastic sheet. You can suture it. It has enough tensile strength. It doesn't disintegrate when you hold it, when you wet it, when you pull on it. And it's watertight right from the beginning. And when you wet it, it gets transparent. So you can see through it. It gets incorporated over a few days with other structures growing through. And it's absorbable. Over a period of time, as a strength, as other structures grow into it, it gets absorbed. The strength is maintained as the graph below shows. It doesn't stick. I've been using this for the last three, four years, and I have had occasions when I needed to go back in for various reasons, and it doesn't stick. It completely nicely peels off, and it's really good. You can onlay it, not a problem. You can suture it, and it's a very nicely suturable product. You can use it in endoscopic surgery. It's very easily conformable, comes in different sizes. And because it's synthetic, you can do whatever you want with it. So a microvascular decompression, you can suture it all up. You can glue it down with whatever else you want it to do. You can use it for expansile duroplasties uh, in the spinal cord if you needed to. So it's rapidly, it, it, it serves our purpose. It has high strength, handles well, it's absorbable. It does what it's supposed to do. It prevents a CSF leak. It doesn't stick to the structures it shouldn't stick to. Being synthetic, it's got a three to five year shelf life. And the best part is when you do a large craniectomy, for example, you just need one big large patch. Being synthetic, it is not limited by the size of the animal. So looking at our characteristics that we wanted to look at, our holy grail, it meets all our requirements. In terms of inexpensive, well, I don't know exactly how much it costs, but it doesn't seem to be any more because my hospital has approved it. That's me. Any questions? I think there's time for a couple of questions, even, and then we can leave a, a further discussion to the end when we've heard both speakers. Are there any questions at this stage to Ravi? Ravi, can I, can I kick off? Uh, do you use any other method to kind of belt and braces, like, for example, lumbar drains in Because the repair is so good, and I use a sealant on top, I have not needed to. So it wouldn't be routine practice for no. you to do that? And what's the kind of evidence for the clinical use of this in, in other countries, units? Do you, do you have I'm led to believe it's used in 60 countries. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you use it around the world, there are lots of papers on it. So I was a late adopter for it. I mean, it's only recently come to the UK in that sense, but it's been used abroad a lot more. So I'm, I'm sure if we take a kind of, you know, straw poll here as to what the ideal would be for various people practicing here. Does, does anyone use Redura? Alistair, what's your experience? Um, I think it, it, <laughs> the risk is certainly like an advertisement here. I think it's the most compatible um, substance that I've found. I'm not an enormous user. by the company, but I'm not. Oh, I don't sound like anything. I'm just being given the microphone. Thank I mean, you. Uh, are there any, any who, who have an experience of another substitute which they would swear by and say, that's, that's my go-to? Because you had a long list of 
substance. We used to use urogen before. And uh, it, 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 it's in fact a nightmare when you actually have so many choices. Mm. Uh, so what, what do you think is the top three, Ravi? Uh, I, I'm conscious the sponsors are listening to you. <laughs> <laughs> we used to use urogen before. The problem I found, I mean, I've always been thinking, I don't tell my patients what I'm putting in. And I've always felt that this was not right. So that's a big thing for me. And I was looking for a synthetic substitute if it was available. I mean, we have some years down the line discovered diseases in stuff that we have put in before. So this brings in a different dimension to the discussion about <clears throat> how, how much should we be telling our patients. So if you have a patient who's a vegan or a vegetarian, yeah. and there are quite a number amongst us. So w you would say this is ideal for, for... I don't have to think about it. I can sleep well. Alistair. One of the problems is that you don't always know when you're going to be Needing using it. this. And yes. so we end up with this omni-consent form that caters for every possible eventuality, which of course is, is what the lawyers uh, would like us to. Actually, the lawyers don't want us to do that. The lawyers want us to stay as we are so they can sue us. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, you know, that, that's what they pretend is the ideal. Um, but you know, probably 50% of the time you use this, you don't think you're going to need something True. at the end. So could I just ask, um, just by show of hands, how, how many of us actually think about this aspect when we are consenting and inserting material? It's a small number, two in fact, which is, uh, which is interesting. I mean, w y yes, of course, please. I've yet to have a patient decline that. Okay. So, okay. I mean, would it stand up to Montgomery? Would you state which animal? Yes. Okay. Interesting. Any other comments, questions? Rick? Well, uh, sorry for croaking. Um, I, I think it's a very important issue. And certainly, if you take the, uh, the allografts, Duragard and, and uh, similar um, products, the claim that these um, will integrate and are biological implants, mm -hmm. um, well, I'm not going to say it's false, but my experience, particularly with skull-based procedures, is that this material does not integrate. Um, and I've certainly had a couple of instances where uh, I'm sure the Juragar patches have been responsible for low-grade and then significant um, skull base infections because they don't yeah. absorb. Yeah. They just sit there, you know, basically as a foreign body. Um, and I think, that, I think this discussion is timely. Um, yeah. I think if you're going to use allografts, then in the current climate, I think you are probably going to have to get consent to use that as an implant. Yeah. Whereas I, I don't think you would have concerns about using um, synthetic and absorbable substances. Yeah. But after all, they're, they're not that much different um, in chemical terms from the absorbable sutures we use. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, well, we'll probably have another opportunity later on in the day when there's another paper being presented on, on, on this same, same line of thought. Yeah. Um, any trainees who, because, Really, the other people who put these things in and stitch them up. Uh, any comments from trainees? <laughs> okay. Um, right, let's move on then. Ravi, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, would you like to come and introduce our next speaker? Yes, I will introduce uh, Dr. Drinran Guan, who is available online, I guess. He will be talking on cranioplasty with customized implant and surgical approaches from West China Hospital in Sichuan University. Dr. Guan has been working in the field of neurosurgery for nearly 30 years. He specializes in a complex craniocerebral trauma and post-traumatic complications, 
CSF disorders, and trauma of the middle and anterior skull base. Dr. Drin Nguan is the chairman of the Trauma Committee at Sijuan Medical Association. He's the chairman of Nerve Damage and Repair Committee at the Sijuan Physiological Science Association and is a member of various academic associations. He's a leader in his field and has been invited to speak at several domestic and international conferences, has published over 50 peer-reviewed articles in scientific journals, including neurology and brain research, and is the invited reviewer for several journals. Dr. Guan, please. Yeah. Dear President, dear British the neurosurgeons, good morning. I'm Dr. Guan Junwen from the Department of the Neurosurgery, West China Hospital of Sichuan University. It's great pleasure for me and my team have been invited to attend the 2022 British Neurosurgeon Annual Conference. Today, the topic of my report is the green diaplastic with the customized plant materials and the surgical techniques. I'm going to talk about three parts of this report. The first part is the characteristic of the cranial plastic material in China. At present, there are three kinds of the cranial plastic implant the, the materials in China. About 10 years ago, it was mainly the titanium scar repair materials with the change of the economy and the, depending on the understanding, the application of the polyadder ketone as peak material and the autologous scar has greatly increased in 10 years recently. It is precisely because of its wide application that the shortcoming of the titania, the materials, are more easily exploded. For example, the fast head conduction, not taught enough, the stimulation to the scap, not fit tightly at all. Our team published the relevant the cohort retrospective article in the 2018, and the surgical methods represented by the application of the titanium the material is named it the covered cranial plasty. Correspondingly, the surgical methods represented by the peak material is landed embedded cranial plastic. The article is about the, a large uh, multiple center retrospective the research. The outcome showed that the peak is the better than the titanium mesh in terms of the post-operative new scissors implant exposure uh, Reoperation and the, the over, overall the, the complications. And moreover, the cosmetic satisfaction of the peak is better than the titanium mesh, obviously. The international consensus statement on post traumatic cranial plasty, which was the published in the 2021 also cited the conclusion of our team's article. Due to the characteristics of the metal and the limit, imitation of the covered, the cranial plastic, the titanium the mesh is easy to explore and uh, more other defects. For example, implant exposure and uh, escaped burns. This is uh, a type picture of the tetamish the exposed. And this is also the typical the case. The patient's skull defect was repaired with the titanium mesh for half a year. A headache occurred by was the activity in the sun for about uh, 40 minutes. The next day the right 
for had repaired the area began to fear the burning and the blisters. In addition, I'm going to talk about three parts of this report. The first part is the characteristic of the premier plastic material in China. At present, there are three kinds of the cranial plastic implant the, the materials in China. About 10 years ago, it was mainly the titanium scar repair materials. With the change of the economy and the depending of the understanding, the application of the polyazide ketone as peak material and the auto logos the scar has gradually increased in 10 years recently. It is precisely because of its wide application that the shortcoming of the, this is a type picture of the damage the exposed. And this is also the typical the case, the patient's score defect was repaired with the titanium mesh for half a year. A headache occurred by was the activity in the sun for about uh, 40 minutes. The next day, the right forehead repaired the area, began to feel the burning and the blisters. In addition, due to the characteristic of the peak and the embedded, the clear near plastic, the peak was shielded similarly is the germ with the age of the defective the skull. Whether view from the actual prologue and the, the uh, sagittal position. Since the material of the peak is close to the skull itself, so far we have not found a uh, scape burn caused by the head conduction. This is also a typical, the man, the male man, 38 years ago, suffered from a car accident after three months of the decompressive cranial ectomy. The cranial plastic with the peak was the performed. From the CT scan, we can see that these patients not only has the skull defect, but also have the anterior and the posterior scar defect with uneven paths. In the operation, we not only use the peak material to repair the defect of the skull, but also fill it and repair the uneven skull. After operation, the satisfactory results were obtained from the appearance of the patient and the three dimensional CT scanning. Although peak materials can solve some problems, there will still be problems in the cranial face, facial defects on the special location. The most common problem is the defect involving the temporal scope. So the part two, I want to talk about the temporal hollering following the cranial plastic and the management. Most neurosurgeons focus on bone, the reconstruction, but ignore the repair of the soft tissue and the uh, appearance. However, the instant of the temporal hollering is more than 50% after cranial plastic. The first picture showed the area covered by the normal temporal muscle. However, the certain degree of the atrophy temporal muscle in surgery will be funded. This picture is a typical picture of the temporal hollering after the cranial plastic. 
Then how to manage the temporal muscle hollering? Yes. Firstly, we need to find the remaining the temporal muscle can be the construct uh, reconstructed by the thin layer scanning of the three dimension uh, scores CT. According to the thickness of the atrophy, the temporal muscle simulated in CT and the operation, the remaining mm, temporal muscle was classified. This is also the first time in the world to classify the remaining the temporal muscles. Our team classified the remaining temporal muscle as the hypertrophy and flat and the no muscle, three types in total. According to different types, it will be treated by the different way. For hypertrophic type, we adopt the surgical methods that the L-shaped incision was made with the dips along the subfacial layer of the muscle through the incision of the hypertrophic the temporal muscle, reflection of the two layers of the temporal anterior superiorly mimicked the muscle's original anatomy. For flat tape, the straight line incisions was made along the, the superficial temporal fascia. And the extent temporal is, is the fix using the suture's fixation. For low temporal muscle type, in addition to the reconstruction of the skull construct, we also reconstructed the contralateral mural temporal muscle on the basis of it, so that the temporal muscle could be fused to the artificial the material. Of course, up to now, this material is currently limited to the peak. The following slide was the small sample date of our team's statistical outcomes of different the surgical methods dealing with the different temporal, uh, temporal muscle atrophy. We used the ImageJ software to take photos during the operation to compare the increased temperature uh, temporal muscles area before and uh, after the operation. From the statistical outcomes, the increased area of the hypertrophy types is the significant more than that of the flat the types, whether it is extended area or the total increased area. There were also statically a significant difference between the two types of the per and the post operative the muscle areas. It's obvious that the area of the two types increased significantly after the operation, and the most patients and the doctors are satisfied with the surgical result. The following slide shows the different types of the post-operative the photos. These flight types you should see the temporal muscles area is the uh, satisfied. And uh, this is the hypertrophic type. The last is no muscle type. Yeah. 
Yes. Finally, I will take a few minutes to report the ongoing the clinical the trial, TIP trial. For the defect of the score, shall we choose the peak or the titanium mesh in future? Recently, a retrospective the review of the literature show that the peak materials was the significantly better than the titanium mesh in success rate of the surgery and the extent of the complication was the significantly lower than the titanium mesh. Nevertheless, we still need the high level the clinical evidence. So we decided this clinical trial and the landed tips trial. The tips also mean giving a warm the tips on choosing the material. And this clinical trial has been registered on the International Clinical Trial website. The aim of this study was to compare the long-term implant the filler rate and the aesthetic, aesthetic the outcomes, neurological outcomes and the post operative the complications rate of the primary the peak cranial plastic versus premier uh, titanium mesh cranial plastic. We believe the tips trial would provide the high level the clinical the evidence for the clinician to choose the score repair the material. The ethical the application of this clinical trial has been revealed by the Medical Ethics Committee of West China Hospital of Sichuan University and the protocol have been published in journal of the BMJ Open. At present, at present, the trial has collected the patient from the more than 20 centers in China. And the more than 100 patients have been included. This is the map of the center and the patient's the, uh, distribution. I hope this clinical trial can be successfully complete and the final result will be reported to you again. That's all for my speech today. This is a group show, a photo of our department, neurosurgery. There are about more than 80 doctors and with the 350 beds, including an ICU, 50 beds. Uh, there are about the 12,000 operation per year. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Guan. That was an excellent talk. There were certain topics and points that you brought across. One was uh, looking at peak versus titanium and your experience of uh, certain uh, problems with titanium and your no that only uh, use the peak or the the titanium mesh uh, in china we choose the uh, the cranial plastic material uh, according to the patients the economy and the and the wellings, yeah. Right. So the presumption is the titanium is cheaper and peak is more expensive. Would that be right? Oh. 
Okay, of course, the peak expansion, the normal defect uh, uh, cranial the plastic uh, may be 10 times, uh, 10, uh, 100,000, 100,000 IMB, and uh, the type uh, and the titanic mesh it is uh, uh, maybe 10,000. So the 10, 10 times, 10 mm -hmm. times the space, yeah. Okay. Your views, please, on the timing of craniopathy, when we should be performing craniopathy. Is it weeks or months after the original surgery? Yeah, uh, the most patient will be performed the cranial plastic for uh, be late or the uh, maybe the long time, yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Dr. Guan, could I could I ask you whether in your practice do you involve the plastic surgery colleagues to uh, help with the scalp part of the reconstruction? Um, my experience is that a lot of these operations originally when they are when the bone is moved are done for in emergency situations and and the tissue handling uh, is, is the main theme is of getting getting the bone off getting reducing the pressure acutely so what is your experience in terms of the scalp and the problems that you face Yes, we may have been in conflict. Oh, uh, if the uh, if emerg uh, emergency situation of the escape the defect is that question? So yeah. Uh, Actually, Dr. Goan, mm -hmm. the question yeah. is the question okay. is whether you uh, have colleagues like plastic surgeons involved in the reconstruction operation to help you uh, get, get a good scalp closure. Yeah, uh, yeah. The, this was, uh, the situation about the the escape defect. We will be the first. We will uh, cut meeting. Yeah. Uh, we will first. We will invite the first. We will. Invited the plastic surgery uh, to treat the scape of the defect, and then after maybe after half year, we will do the uh, cranial plastic uh, cross cranial plastic uh, after the first uh, operation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have questions going back to the, the dural closure uh, talk? Tr traditionally, um, I, I remember we, we were told that a small hole 
is is worse than a gap that if you leave the dura open there's a chance of natural healing uh, in the in in our current practice uh, we tend to worry about gaps so closing the gap closing the the the, the dura defect has become much more uh, we, are, we are much more focused on that concept uh, what do people think about this the, the concept of natural healing how how many of you if if you have a csf leak during a spinal say a straightforward lumbar disc operation uh, just close the muscle and and think well leave it for natural healing do people still do that yes yes Neat, neat. I think I think there's a big difference between the spine and, and cranium here. I think in the in and I've got no recent experience in the spine, but in the cranium, uh, I'm not bothered about a watertight closure, particularly supratentorally, because I think it will normalise itself. I'm not sure about the healing as you describe it, but I think it, the CSF circulation just sort of normalises over time. Obviously, with the with gravity and, and the column of CSF uh, in the spine, I think it's a completely different matter. So I think you have to separate the two. Yes, I, I think most people would agree with, 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 with uh, that comment. So, Alistair. Uh, uh, one of the things, about having been around for a long time, I've seen countless trials and things of various methods of closing the dura, the stupid little staples and all that sort of thing, in order to pursue this completely illusory goal of a watertight closure. You cannot get a watertight closure in the dura. If you have any pressure at all behind it, it will find its way out. You have not actually closed it, you've simply tacked it together. But one of the advantages of being ancient is, the, uh, like Nihau, I'm not quite as ancient as Nihau. <laughs> I am... Uh, no, I <laughs> Anyone around here who trained in Liverpool, remember two of the consultants intentionally stitched the dura back over the bone, right round the craniotomy, to leave a massive gap. And wow. I used to think this was terrible, having trained somewhere we closed it. There was absolutely no difference in the incidence of pseudomeningus or anything else. So that's why I said earlier on, I'm, I'm someone who likes to close the dura where possible if there are some gaps. It makes very little difference but I absolutely agree with Neil that it depends where you are Neil like yeah. me does a lot of MVDs for instance I, I simply don't care as long as there's something to hold the bone in place afterwards because you never get a pseudomeningus heal from that whereas in the lumbar spine you put a you have a tiny uh, hole in the dura you will get a pseudomeningus heal and I think yeah. most of us nowadays use at least some glue or if not and if, if we can do we try to close it as a primary closure yeah. well an interesting uh analogy and extension of what you said is, is the KRE, foramen magnum decompression, where people who do, and I, I do that, the, the classical Bernard Williams operation, you open the dura widely and create a pseudo seal. And the number of times, oh, a few times I've tried the duroplasty, I've had more problems with CSF leak than with leaving the dura open. Big hole. Any other any other comments before we close the session, Rick? Just going back to the um, cranioplasties. Um, what about some of the old-fashioned approaches? I'm just interested to know whether anyone with cranioplasty, particularly decompressive craniectomy, is harvesting the bone and perhaps using abdominal pockets mm -hmm. and reusing. I mean, are people still advocating that? And then what about the cranioplasty on, shall we say, non-cosmetic areas? So uh, cranial vault, um, I mean, for example, a, a resection of a meningioma with bone invasion. And I would still consider an in situ acrylic um, cranioplasty. It's, uh, if you've done them in the past, it's very easy to do. It's probably about 20 quid for antibiotic impregnated acrylic. So, uh, uh, how many people? <laughs> we've got the we've got the dinosaurs at the front here, <laughs> but um, 
but how many people are still using those very sort of traditional approaches? Yeah, well, I don't use the group, but we quite often use just titanium mesh off the shelf for, for these smaller defects um, in non-cosmetic areas, for sure, Rick. Uh, we don't use, well, we don't do any trauma at our place, as you know, but in, in London, if we see somebody with following, following a, a, a trauma craniotomy with, with a craniectomy, the, the bone is never placed in the, in, the, in the abdominal fat at all. It's only from a sort of abroad or occasional other centres. I think there are there are some centres in the UK that still do I think maybe Hull does it. Um, very far, few and far between. Thanks. Uh, yeah, Rick, thank you. I don't know if that I'm a dinosaur or not, but I don't <laughs> think I do that anymore. <laughs> so the, the, the first question uh, in, in relation to the, um, the material, we are now moving towards titanium. And, and the, the, this issue about meningiomas, so we'll often get a titanium plate made preoperatively instead of making one at the time. Uh, autologous bone flaps, I, I think the problem is the bone often gets resorbed and patients are reporting quite a lot of pain in the abdomen with the bone flaps. So I think most people have moved away from it now, it's my understanding. And the infection risk is greater with autologous bone, yeah. Hatch, in your experience, uh, because we decompressive craniectomy is, is, is now a much more common scenario, what advice would you give in terms of the emergency setting where bone is being removed? Are there any precautions or, or, or techniques that you would recommend in that initial operation, which will subsequently be of help? Yeah, I, mean, I, I think we, it's interesting in terms of the, following the craniectomy and the cranioplasty operation, that can be quite a struggle with adhesions. and. We're putting layers of at least one layer of surgery cell underneath the flap to, okay. to create that easier cranioplasty plane. And there may be a role for these newer dural substitutes to do that to make the cranioplasty easy. We're also going for earlier cranioplasties. Mm -hmm. So there is a plane already there. Yeah. <clears throat> and we've currently randomized a few patients into a pilot study of timing of cranioplasty. I think there's a perception that early cranioplasty may be associated with higher infection rate. I don't actually think that's true. And certainly the patient's benefit in terms of headache and better rehabilitation if you get the skull reconstructed earlier. Thank you. Of well, the, <coughs> right. sorry, of the cranioplastic materials, would you prefer a titanium or a peak? So we, we tend to go for titanium and we 3D print the plate now so you can model it on the other side, actually use titanium powder and scintillate it and the yeah. printer will, will, will make it and they're, they, they're a really good fit. We don't have much experience with peak. And the only time that we use peak, for example, here is when we need to give some post-operative therapy. But uh, yeah. has, has anybody ever seen the experience that uh, Dr. Vaughan was talking about of blistering of the skin? It, uh, I think it's not hot enough here. I don't. I, I don't think it. There's too much rain here for that, isn't there? <laughs> I guess so. I've never seen it. So. And does anybody do have any ideas or techniques of doing anything about the temporal hollowing? Well, I think that's cosmetically very important that you, you take care of that temporalis muscle because um, I, I think it's just ignorant if you leave that under the cranioplasty itself. I mean, I have seen it uh, in going back into some cases where um, it, it was done uh, by a trainee or so, and they just put the cranioplasty on top of the temporalis muscle. I think that's just un un unacceptable. But I mean, if you do dissect it, because the muscle has kind of shrunk down, the hollowing will still be apparent. Yeah, you d you just can only uh, repair what you can okay. repair. What has atrophied, you can't make up. So, uh, but you need to prep it off, and you need to put it on top of the cranioplasty and you need to take special care to try to get a good cosmetic result. I think that's very important. Okay. So, please. I'm just interested, um, Hutch, in your work about the timing of cranioplasty because one of the problems that you run into if you leave it very late is the scalp recession and shrinkage. Mm -hmm. And you can get yourself awful difficulties yes. imagining that you can reconstruct symmetrically. Mm -hmm. And you get there with your titanium implant 
and you suddenly realize you've got a two centimeter deficit skin in terms of skin cover. Mm -hmm. So that might be another important factor. So that's a tricky problem to handle. And yeah. sometimes I've, I've deliberately accepted that you'll have to have a suboptimal reconstruction mm -hmm. to avoid compromising the scalp flap. And I, and I agree with Nihal. I mean, we frequently have the assistance of our plastic surgeons and some of these cases you will have to look at uh, rotation flaps and yes. pericranial uh, skin grafting to, to get decent cover. Yes. I think the longer you wait, the more likely you get a scalp uh, issue. Okay. So I, I think it's been a very uh, interesting and uh, thought-provoking session. Thank you all for attending. And thank you for the two speakers uh, for their excellent presentations. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>